All set. All set. Well, we've just gone through seven vignettes there, seven scenes that have sort of depicted what sexual harassment, sexual discrimination is all about. Uh, what, how'd you feel about those? What'd you think of those? Well, those were all pretty obvious, I thought. Okay. They were. I don't think any of us had any, uh, anybody here have any problem? No, the woman was a little subtle. I mean, I don't know if it really, you might, mm -hmm. I mean, she, I don't know that, you, I wouldn't want to confront her on it because yeah. I don't know if she was really, she could have been, you know, acting herself. Dennis? What when do they show the subtle ones? You know, it's, it's easy to see those, but when they, the, the subtle ones are different. Day. Oh yeah, these are so blatant that we can all get it, but you know, the, the ones that are the bigger problem are the subtle ones. No, it's a good question that you bring up and one that's come up before. One that actually, when they put together the workshop, they thought a lot about that. And uh, quite frankly, as we go through this education process, in order to get things started and get us more focused on the problem, we wanted to use scenes, there was a conscious decision to use scenes that are so blatant that everybody can relate to it and see it as sexual harassment, sexual discrimination. Now, admittedly, you could go back and we could modify those scenes and get more subtle. Quite frankly, some of the people that are guilty of this that might not even get the subtle ones. Yeah, but are they going to fire you if you hang your Playboy calendar up on the wall? Um, that question I think we'll come to in just a moment after we go through the uh, federal guidelines, which is what we're going to move into very shortly. And if I don't answer it at that time, if you will ask me again, please, please make sure that I answer that question to your satisfaction okay. at that time. Okay, and we would like to uh, move on, as I just said, to the consequences of sexual harassment, sexual discrimination. Uh, we've talked about the scenes, now we sort of know what it is, but uh, so what? What happens to us if we're guilty of that? What are the liabilities for the company? What are the liabilities for the employees uh, under this? Uh, earlier today, you've heard reference to the fact that within the corporation, we've fired people, we've uh, demoted people, or we've severely reprimanded people that have been guilty of sexual discrimination, sexual harassment. And as you would expect, each one of those cases was treated on a case-by-case -case basis, just as it would have been if we were in federal court. And so each one is weighed on its own merit and its own particular circumstances, and so there are no gross generalizations out there operating. Every case that is filed is taken seriously, and it is investigated thoroughly. I think it's important that you know that. What I'd like to do now, with your permission, is I'd like to pass out these EEOC guidelines, and let's take a look at what the law says on sexual harassment. I have booklets for each one of you here. We've spared no expense, one for each. Here's one for you, one for you, two for you, one for you. Okay. Was that uh, sexual discrimination you gave her to? No, it was favoritism, really. Oh, okay. Okay. That's because you didn't get one to Julie. Uh, yes, she can pass it on. However, let's take a look now. Would you mind if I uh, sit down for a little bit? No, I'm right. sort of tired of standing here. I'm too relaxed on me. I want to first flip back to this chart, though. Remember, this was our working. Uh, I'm, as we go through this section, I want to have this up. Uh, this is our working definition of sexual harassment, and we'll be talking about uh, sexual discrimination, sexual harassment, and guidelines. This is the working definition. What we're going to be looking at now is the federal guidelines. And as you can expect, that gets a little more technical. OK. Now I want to tell you, when I start going through these guidelines, um, my job is to cover these guidelines and tell you about them. And your job is to listen. Now, if you get through before I do, if you'll just sit quietly till I get to the end, I would really appreciate it. Seriously, I would like to say that, uh, as you can guess, this is going to be a little bit a dry part of the uh, presentation because it's legalese a little bit. It's getting down to the uh, nitty gritty. And I want to tell you right up front and beg your indulgence, I'm not a lawyer. We're into an area now that this is probably the least expert, expert that you're going to hear today. So I'll try to attempt to answer any questions that you have, but if they get too legal, you may hear me say something like, I'll come back uh, and go talk to our friends in the legal department and may have to get you a definite answer. But to the best that I can, I will attempt to answer any questions that you might have. Let's take a look at them. If you get the booklet that I just passed out to you, and um, these guidelines were issued in 1980. They, uh, 
really are not law, but they are the basis for determining whether uh, they are the basis for upholding the law. And what we'll do is we'll start through here, and I will look at the various sections so we can cover these a little bit better. If you'll open it up to page one, and I start referring to section A, section B, uh, when I start, section A will be on page one, and it's this small letter A. That's sort of grounds you in on where we'll be going through. Okay, let's take a look first at uh, the definition of sexual harassment. In that first section, as you read through it, and I don't want to attempt to read through all of that because if I do, then I'll have to put these on, and then I'll look like Bob Newhart for the rest of the presentation, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to refer to sort of a summary, but if you can read along, and I'll make a few comments, and then you feel free to jump in and ask any questions that you want to ask as we go through. You've heard people today, earlier today, people talk about quid pro quo and simple this for that. Well, this first particular section talks about the fact that it pertains to the unwelcome advances, and I'd like to emphasize unwelcome, uh, request for sexual favors or other verbal or physical sexual conduct relating to hiring or firing decisions. I'd like to pause at this point and tell you that up until recently, back in the earlier days, that basically primarily was about the only thing that ever got really enforced, was whether somebody actually lost their job as a result of sexual harassment or sexual discrimination. But certainly that has been expanded beyond now, and these guidelines go much further than that. So basically, when you go back to what I was talking about, that earlier on, submission to such conduct was a term or condition of an individual's employment. But when they expanded it and passed out these guidelines, we moved into other areas and made it more explicit. Actually, it moved on to affecting any type of employment decision. And also, it got into the area of creating an intimidating environment. Can somebody give me an example of what you would think about was an intimidating environment? Think back to the vignettes you just saw. The shop scene. The shop scene. How was that intimidating? Exactly. The tone of the guy's voice. Okay. You know. Good. The pictures on the wall. What about Mike's Playboy calendar? Wouldn't that be offensive? Okay. Remember earlier on when I said if you would hold that question? Certainly if they found that offensive, then that would be something that would be asked to be removed in order to remove the offensive nature of that environment. But isn't there always going to be something that offends someone at work? I'm sure there always will be. So uh, I mean, what if I just have it in my locker, you know, and uh, it, hey, that's my locker. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's in there. Who's yeah, my cubicle. It? I mean, I can put what I want in there. Okay, to the extent that you do that or have it in your locker and your cubicle and it's not a problem to anyone else or no one ever brings that to your attention, uh, you know, you may be doing something which nobody finds offensive because it's not offending anyone. But uh, how does the group feel? Suppose somebody comes into your cubicle and they're offended by what's in there. Do you have any obligation to those people? If you think back to our goal, well, we want to show respect for everybody. Okay. As long as they're reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if we go back to an earlier comment, everybody's offended at everything at some point in their life. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, Dennis, how would you define, how would we define reasonable? You know, we're, we're moving into an area. I guess, I guess I would ask you that. Uh, <coughs> I can't think of, if, in my office right now, and I run 1,600 people through it, somebody's going to find something offensive. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be of a sexual nature or just offensive? They don't like my family pictures. They don't like the dirt in the corner. I'm offended Anything by women who wear green sweaters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Julina, you're wearing green today. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a sweater, though. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? If you think back to our goal, how far should we go to create a respectful environment? Well, Ralph, what about the DuPont calendars? The calendars that DuPont itself prints out with, you know, women in bathing suits or whatever. And oh, you're talking about the refinished calendars? Yeah, yeah. And they, now my locker, I've got two overseas one. Mm -hmm. The company's yeah, really about. talking on both sides yeah. of their mouth. Well, you know, I think you might be interested in a recent development on that. I believe a meeting was held recently, I think was in Baltimore. Don't hold me to that because I don't really know the details. But our chairman, Ed Woolard, was there, and he was asked that very same question. And in fact, I think it sort of uh, caught him and said, tell me a little bit about those calendars, you know, because Ed's from Fiber's department and probably uh, these uh, FPD calendars uh, he'd not encountered. So um, they told him a little bit about those calendars. And by the time Ed got back to Wilmington, do you realize 
it was sort of strange. He already had a call from FPD department that said that they were going to discontinue those calendars because they thought with our new goal and environment that those did not fit with the corporate image that we were trying to move toward. So I think you can very shortly see a discontinuance of those calendars. For real. For real. And I hope that gives you the positive signal of the kind of uh, seriousness that we are giving this subject. Suppose uh, they lose business because those auto body shops won't buy DuPont paints anymore. Well, you know, Mr. Woolard, I think, had enough confidence in our marketing department of uh, auto finishes that we could sell our product based on other merits other than without these calendars. So I think he's willing to take that business risk. And again, that's refreshing that, you know, he would put that kind of business ahead. If you're going to mind me having the old refinish, I collect the old refinished calendars. If you don't mind me having those in my offer. I think uh, as long as they're not offending anyone, Mike, but I think you might want to you know, go back and think some more about this environment thing and, uh, you know, if, if whether you are offending anyone or if anybody's brought that to your attention or anything like that. I hold on to them like they're going to become a hot collector. Now. In well, fact, Mike, so. That's money you take them home. Yeah, Mike, in fact, I would suggest you might want to take them home because as time goes by, they're going to get more and more valuable and somebody might steal them out of your locker. You're trying, to get, you're trying to get me to get them out of the workplace, aren't you? <laughs> Any way we can create a better environment, Mike, is fine. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to section B, if you would. Uh, each one of these, as uh, I mentioned earlier on, is treated on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I think I'll move on to the next one, because that's all the script says right here, case-by-case -case basis. And uh, forgive me for using this. By the way, you might not understand that I only recently went through facilitating training, and you're my first group. So I'm really appreciating the cooperation you're giving me here. Oh, you know. ah, sure. You'd say that to all of the facilitators, but uh, I do appreciate it. And as I go through this more often, I'm sure I'll get more familiar with the script. So thanks again for your forbearance through that. Um, move down to Section C for a moment. I want to look at that. This, we're getting into an area now where we're getting into some liabilities for the company and for individuals. Take a look in a moment at uh, Section C, and it talks about harassment by supervisors. And this is whether the company knows about it or not and whether it approves or disapproves. This employer can be held liable and the individual can be held personally liable regardless of the knowledge of the policy or our policy prohibiting the harassment. Do yes, mean, Mike. Do you mean if, I'm, if I've got some supervisor that works for me mm -hmm. and he goes out here and he messes around with his secretary and I don't know anything about it, they're going to come back and hold me liable for that? If that secretary makes a complaint and nothing is done about that, then you could be held responsible for that. That's right, Mike. But how could I, as a manager, necessarily know what this guy does? I mean, it, maybe he just gives her a ride home or something, you know? Uh, how am I supposed to know that? I mean, they're going to hold me personally responsible for that? Mike, you know, I think that's one I can relate to, and I think it's going to get to be more and more of a challenge to all of us, this idea of should have known and what we should know about our employees and what the well, council of supervisors... What's the supervisors. company going to do to back me up? I mean, hey, I, 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 I've seen guys who look perfectly fine, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and do a great job that will, I mean, you send them out on a convention out here or something else, I mean, they're, they're going off the wall. Uh, if, if some woman that he works for comes over and asks him for a ride or something, or he, he sets it up that way and does something on the way home, I don't see why I should personally be blamed for that. How do the rest of you feel about Mike's point here? Yeah, what are the liabilities? I mean, who's liable? Am I personally liable if I'm a manager or supervisor? We as managers and supervisors do carry an extra measure of liability, and that's one of the education processes that we're going through and why we're conducting these workshops is to make us all aware of that. I think the worst case would be for you to have that personal liability and yeah, not know, you know about it. Yeah. I can see the personnel people. I mean, they hired this guy. They ought to. They ought to screen <clears throat> him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if somebody comes along and makes a decision that he ought to, he ought to be in my group, and I'm going to have to supervise him. And he's got people to supervise. I count on them screening him before it gets to me. Mm -hmm. And then he comes along and does something. You know, two weeks, two two months into the job. I mean, what am I going to do? Okay. I I feel like I'm stuck. I mean, what's the company going to do to back me up? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm personally held liable for this. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it seems like some guy in the personnel office ought to be held liable, not me. 
Well, one of the things the company is going to do to back you up and try to help you is through programs such as this to educate all of those people, including this supervisor, as to what their conduct should be. So hopefully we're going to begin to upgrade our conduct. That's one of the things we're going to do. But as I said, we go through this, we're going to have to learn to some way manage these broader spans of control. And I can relate exactly to what you're talking about. It's very tough to know what all your employees are doing you know, on the job. Uh, some of the rest of you that are in supervisory or managerial positions, uh, how do you think we're going to be able to modify our behavior and our approach in the future to keep better tabs on this kind of thing? It seems like we have to make an extra effort to try to get out in the area maybe more than we have in the okay. past or be real sensitive to comments people make. The old management by walking around? Yeah, exactly. how, about, how about yourself? If you see something, don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility. Yeah, but what if you don't see anything? Well, maybe if you if you follow Dennis's idea, get out in the market, uh, out in the uh, office area. Oh yeah, but you know, I'm guys, sure. when the boss is when the boss is around, particularly when he's a manager. I mean, if it was a first line supervisor walking around, that might be one thing. You fit some of the guys, but a, a manager coming around, if you don't get around that section too often. I'm sure if it's something that it would it would have been impossible for you to have known that you wouldn't be held liable. I think it's. Maybe things that you really should know as a supervisor, but there are some things that there's no way you could know. Uh, I don't think they, they, would they be held liable for that type of thing? That's what I'm it saying. Seems. I mean, I, they're coming at me personally on this thing. But what yeah, if I'm I don't on, think that's right. Yeah, what if I'm on two week vacation and this harassment takes place and I'm a supervisor? What then? Well, it, when you get back and you're made aware of it, uh, you know, that been a complaint filed, as you said earlier, and you were right on track, what your response to that is, and to make sure that it is taken care of, is really the responsibility that you're required to carry out. So you're talking about inactivity if we do not respond once it's brought to our attention. Mm -hmm. Mike, you seem to be uh, having a little bit of a difficulty here. Is this because uh, you're really feeling that this is a little bit unfair to be held personally responsible? Uh -huh. Yeah, you you like. um, I'm right. sorry, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel so bad, Dick. Um, <laughs> Ernie. I called Dick yesterday the other day. Yeah. I like the uh, being able to uh, stand up, sit down, go back up, flip a chart, come back, sit down, be able to move around, uh, vary that. Um, I liked being able to get through this knowing more than I thought I knew about what was in that script. I was really concerned about that before we got up here because uh, I thought maybe I might be just reading verbatim, but I think I dropped back and started into more of a summarizing, paraphrasing mode, but still felt that I stuck pretty close to what we were supposed to cover. Um, and as you would suspect, I like being able to use some degree of humor to maybe engage the audience to give me some license to not have to be on the spot so much. And they seem to accept that, and I, and I appreciate that. Okay. Feedback for Ralph. I had, I had a whole, my problem was I was writing down things I liked, and I was having trouble paying attention to what was going on. After a while, I had to stop. Uh, do gestures and your eye contact I liked. Uh, uh, I thought you did a very good job of creating a non-threatening environment. Yet at the same time, I had no sense of, of a limp type of thing. I mean, you, you came across very solidly, and yet you, were, you did a great job in a non-threatening environment. I liked moving from the, the book back to the chart. You're changing media. I thought that was good. Uh, did a good job, I think, a couple of times in terms of repeating something twice uh, and otherwise emphasizing specific points. I like that. Uh, you mentioned you weren't an expert. I thought film rising mm -hmm. and making us feel comfortable mm -hmm. also. I thought you did a good job with the very, with a very dry section of the yeah. 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 guidelines. Did you have her? Um, is there the dry section of the law? I gave him a very dry section, yeah. I mean, you were able to, you were able to convey the seriousness yeah. of it mm -hmm. with, that, with, with some humor and stuff, but, you know, without reducing how important those were. Yeah, that was important to me. 
and that it is important. And this might be tougher than what you'll see on the field. I don't know, but the workshop I went to, there was a lot of feedback during the big dance, but during this, everybody just accepted this information and listened to it. Now, if it's a group of supervisors or managers, it could be as lively as what Mike is, I'm mm -hmm. sure. But the average group may not respond too much to this portion. Mm -hmm. Point of information. Uh, hey, hang on, let me finish oh, the you, feedback, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the apology I thought was unnecessary. Yeah. Don't yes. even let people know that, that you're new to this because you don't seem like you're new right, to right. this. Right, right. You weren't fumbling. Not at all. But, you're but, totally confident. But then again, on the other hand, if you are nervous about it, I think it's not a bad idea to mention it. But that's the wrong problem. Get it out. I was told a long time ago when you're making a presentation of anything, never apologize for anything because what you do is you point it out and you bring it to people's attention. So I would. I would debate that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. I've heard that too. I mean, you, you messed up a lot. I could see you saying okay. something to me about it, but you weren't, certainly weren't messing up. I did that at a point where I thought I messed up, uh -huh. which is interesting. Good observation. We never, we didn't know. Okay. I didn't notice. And one mess up doesn't cause an apology anyway. If you're going through string after string at some point, you know, look, folks, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is my first time. And, okay. Well, when they're looking to see if there's a trap on the floor to drop you through. Anything. Right. Right. Okay. You seem very comfortable now. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You're also very calming. Yeah. Other feedback? I just like the way you referred back to the chart. You got a body chair walk back. That's something I certainly use too. Mm -hmm. you know, when you don't just go through the book. Yeah. That can be dry. But break that up and walk over. Refer to whatever charts are up. Mm -hmm. Remember the pointing. I uh, like, especially what Maureen said to you, I think that you did inject uh, some life into uh, a dead part of the workshop. Uh, we know it's a dead part of the workshop. Uh, uh, there are a number of ways of handling it, one of which, if you're pressed for time, is just not to do it. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, we realize it's a dry area of the workshop, and you did a nice job of injecting that. I liked your humor. Uh, I wrote down the word friendly. Alicia conveyed that to me. Uh, you, uh, you made use of a, a direct question to Dennis, which was an interesting uh, ploy, and I think that uh, was useful. I like the warmth in your voice, despite your southern accent. <laughs> I like the warmth in your voice. Now we get it on tape. <laughs> uh, I would I would go even a step further than uh, Julene would. Uh, I think that uh, if you apologize for your workshop, uh, apologize for your experience or something like like that, uh, uh, I think it's a manifestation of a need to be liked. I think it's a, uh, uh, a bit of a cop-out that says, take it easy on me, folks, this is my first workshop. And what the group is going to read that as, they'll accept that from you, and they won't challenge you. Right? And, the, uh, and they're not going to allow you to give them everything you have to give them. And you've got a lot to give them. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so I would encourage you not, not to do that. Uh, remember, folks, that if you get into these guidelines, uh, that uh, guideline A is the definition. And you've probably already gone through the definition in the front piece of the workshop. So you don't need to repeat that again. You did a nice job with it. What I would offer to you is think about using those techniques when you go through the definition, all right? Uh, because you injected some life into that. But you don't want to do it twice. Most times when we do guideline A, we say this is guideline A and it is our definition and we move right along. And we do guideline B just the way you, you did it, mm -hmm. right? case by case basis. Then you get into the meat of it with C and D. Okay. Okay. Um, I share one thing with you. I said to a group once, uh, with your permission, I'll do this. And one guy said, you don't have my permission to do that. And then, and then where do you go, folks? I mean, you know, that guy was obnoxious, but that, that was his words. You don't have my permission to do that. All right, and so then you engage in a little bit of stupid dialogue around that. Uh, and 
I only offer that to you because it happened to me on one occasion. Mm -hmm. Good job. Very good.